morning. morning. Buenos días. Bienvenido. Okay, I'm trying. All right, I'm trying. (laughs) I'm trying. I really am. Okay, that's enough though. (laughs) Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I want to begin by thanking Tony. I want to thank him for preaching a really good message. He's a talented preacher and indeed a blessing to this church family. And amen. And a blessing to me and my family because every few weeks he gives us a weekend, (laughs) an unheard of thing in pastoral work, but he gives it to me. So there are so many people here operative in the body of Christ. Tony is one of them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Tony mentioned that he liked Marvel comics or Marvel, I can see how old I am, right? Marvel movies. But the MCU, is that what it's called? I'm, I'm using big words, right? But Iron Man in particular. So he made mention of the fact that they have the same first name, Tony. So people can call him Stark, not me. Exactly. I prefer Tony's real superhero name, Deputy Johnson. He's a real-life superhero, complete with uniform and shield. And so he is a blessing not only to this church, but to the community it serves. So thank you very much for all that you do for everyone involved. You get, yes, that's perfectly fine. Yes. Thank you. I'm done embarrassing him. I did that last week, too. He got, <laughs> he got mad at me, but that's another story. <laughs> Never again. All right. We play. We have fun. So he got me thinking about things from my childhood that I still like. And for me, well, I did like Marvel and DC. I liked Spider-Man. I was a big fan of Spider-Man and even had Spider-Man painted on my wall. Now, that would not be allowed today in my house. She's like, nope. (laughs) I get away with Bibles and guitars are all over my bedroom wall. That's it. So that's, that's pretty good. I'm doing good. Very masculine type of room. She lives in it. So we're good. But I thought about it. I'm like, no, not Spider-Man. I don't need him on my wall anymore. The underoos, that would be embarrassing. So if you know, you laughed. You're that old. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, no, not Spider-Man. So I started thinking. I'm like, what do I still like or what do I do? Video games. I am from the video game generation. So right when they started coming out commercially, so this is how old I am. I remember Pong, and and it was just like the square. And I was like, boop, 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 like all over the screen. And you had both the controller and the thing. And I had it on a black and white TV. That was the spare TV. So the kid always gets like the hand-me-down. So black and white TV, I know what that's like and everything, antennas. So I remember that. Then we got to the Atari. We got to the Atari, but in my case, it was the Sears Telegames version. Nobody laughed. Okay, so that's like the knockoff Atari. That's what that is. But the cartridges still work. And so that's what I got. I got the Sears version of everything. So I didn't get the BMX. I got the Sears bikes. So that's how it was with me. Just a little complaining. Anyway, moving on, I had the Atari cartridges worked. And there was a specific type of game that I came to like, which I still like today. I like a good quest game. They'd call them like a sandbox game or an open world game. I like a good quest, though. And I like everything about the quest. Sometimes you'll get these quest items, and you've got to use them for a certain thing. And I can remember the first quest game that I can remember. I'm not saying it's the first one, but it was literally Adventure. You want to play that game? Adventure. And it was cool, but it was not. It was cool for the time because you were represented by this little square. That was you. (laughs) You didn't have hands or anything. When you got close to the quest items, like the key, you you would just kind of be with you. And it would stick to you somehow. I don't know. And it had a dragon. But the dragon didn't look anything like the dragon on the box or the cartridge. No. The dragon looked like a pixelated duck looking for a handout, if I'm being honest. It was really, so now look it up and you'll go, wow, that's pretty accurate. It is. But here's the thing. It's like a magic about it. It would still scare you. So it's like a little dot. I'm like, no! 
And then you're like, run away, run. And it's like, scroll, scroll, scroll. And the duck is coming. So it would be like exciting. And then the video games evolved. And we got good graphics. And they became more complicated. So now your quest items would have an effect on you. You know, do I use this? What's it going to be used for later? And then you have a carry weight. And you can only carry so much stuff unless you have, like, the special backpack or something like that or whatever. And so you'd have to make decisions. There was a lot of thinking. You know, what could this be used for? So that was my favorite, quest items and quest games. I still play them when I have the time. So. My daughter, as she grew up, she began playing video games. This made me happy. I'm like, oh, there's at least one thing we can do together. So <laughs> we're having common. I don't understand anything else you like. So anyway, she liked them. But what was funny is when she first started, it was right around the time Minecraft came out. And so it was really funny because it's like a regression in graphics, you know. It's like, what? You know, so I'm like, everything, like my wife would come out and play a game. She's like, what are you watching? I'm like, I'm playing this me. You know, it's like, this is really amazing, the graphics. And so I walk in and I see this game for the first time. And I think, did you find my Atari? <laughs> you know, like, what happened here? I thought mom sold it with the Star Wars toys at the, gar the garage sale, right? I could have put you through college on that. Anyway, literally. So... <laughs> Quests. Today we're going to be looking at a biblical quest. And so let's keep um, just at the beginning of this our sense of humor hat on. Just, just, just throughout the beginnings, we, we warm up to this topic. It's going to get kind of interesting. So to recap, we looked at, so Tony's message, then we looked at Esther. And along with Esther, we looked at Judith. Now, some of you just stay calm. Stay in, your, <laughs> stay in your seats. It's going to be okay. Just stay with me. I'll do some explaining. What this now brings us to, if we're looking at the Bible of the early church, is Tobit. Again, some of you, stay calm. Remain in your seats. All right, if that's not funny to you, that's awesome, because I really don't have to disclaim or anything. But we're going to look at some history today. So Tobit is a book that is not in all Bibles now. But listen carefully. It was a part of the Bible of the early church and remained a part of the Bible for 1,800 years of Christian history. Think about it. So a lot of Christians don't regard this as Scripture, about 40%. 40% of Christians do not regard this as Scripture, but 60% do. So it's kind of interesting. We'll get there in a second. <clears throat> um, whatever your standpoint is, and that's fine, non-denominational church. That's it. You can be a Christian and believe in Scripture or not. Fine. We're not, we don't argue about that stuff here. We keep the gospel at the center. That's the important stuff. The other stuff, just like the meat sacrifice to idols, if you know your Bible really well. If you don't, don't argue with me. Anyway, <laughs> but Tobit's a popular story, which we can glean lessons from. And so that's the point here. Now, if there's I, one room schoolhouse, so there's some of you, you just don't care. You're like, great, just tell the story. You don't have to explain it. All right? Some people don't even read the Bible at all. Some people do read the Bible. Some people believe it's Scripture, and you're going, yes, we're doing Tobit. Some people are like, ah, I'm going to get set on fire. And so this is really more, more for that group. I just want to bring you through a process that I went through several, several years ago. And so I want to kind of take you through a process. If you don't care, history lesson. You're going to learn a little bit of history here, and it's going to get a little interesting, right? So I'll get back to the jokes. We're definitely going to get to Jesus today. That's where we're going to land the plane there, <laughs> right? But let's just put the history hat on and just be a little open here. So I'm trying to come at this. For those of you who have been here for a while, we're like, we know. Just I'll come at it from a little bit of a different angle to keep you entertained, right? So here's what we'll do. When I was done with pastor school and I was ordained, I continued my studies. But... I started thinking because I realized that I grew up Catholic and then I came into Protestantism. I realized that we were saying we were a non-denominational church, but we were not. We were coming at it from Protestantism, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. That's where I was coming from. But I realized I was we were really just like kind of a mash up of a you know Methodist Baptist church, and then when you know uh, charismatic people came in, yeah, we do that too. You know, <laughs> it was just this crazy mess. But our doctrinal statement was Protestant. That's what it was. And I realized that I'm like, huh? Does anyone ask why? Like, what? We're not really non-denominational. 
And so that got interesting. I was like, we're lying. This isn't true. So I started by saying, okay, let me look at what the Bible says church should be and then test everything. And so I got really annoying to the leadership, right? So <laughs> let's, why do we do that? 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 And what does it say here? And bring everything back to here. And I realized, and this is not just Protestantism. This is just every denomination. They're not all right. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not biblical. And so I started looking at it, going through. And then there was a natural progression, because I want you to logic hat now on. Think about it. While they're writing the New Testament, they don't have the New Testament. It's kind of weird, right, to think about that. The Gospels aren't being written as it goes. It's within a witness period, and I've talked about that. Very solid, very Loctite, but it's not there yet. So the early church might not even have the Gospels, and they talk about this. And so certain people have 1 Corinthians, and they're, they were copying it fervently because they didn't have other letters from Paul. So you'd get a letter from Paul. Phoebe might bring it in. They're like, wait. And they're like, they would literally wash off the papyrus, and they'd start copying the letter. That's why we have so many copies. We have so many early copies, and they were diligent. They were really careful to make sure they got it exactly right. They believed it was the Word of God, and they were dying for it, literally. So you start forming the Bible, but you realize when you're looking at early church, you have to look at the church just beyond the New Testament, right? Because <laughs> what did they do? How did they interpret some of these things? And so one of the things that I started to look at and I got really into was biblical history. Like, what did the Bible look like as the apostles? And let's just say Jesus saw it. How did, how, what did it look like to them? And so if you know me, I have a passion for ancient Greek. That's why, because everything's being read and written in ancient Greek. And so I began looking at the Bible of the early church, early manuscript copies, or early fragments, uh, church, early church fathers talking about it, you know, dialoguing between letters. And what did it look like? So there are two things that now just, if you're also coming from a Protestant denomination, blew my mind, like totally, like I couldn't believe it. Two features. One should have been obvious, because if you read your Bible from the beginning, that is the introduction, they tell you some of these things. <laughs> and it's also all over the footnotes, all over the place, and I'll show you that later. The first thing, the whole Bible from Old Testament to New is all in Greek, not Hebrew, Greek. They believed it to be a superior translation that pointed better to Jesus, and indeed, you need to read the Greek Old Testament to get certain prophecies about Jesus. It's not in the Hebrew. That was the first thing. <clears throat> okay. That's interesting, but then I went back to my Bible. I was like, oh, they're telling me that the whole time. So anyway, that was the first thing. The second thing, depending on what copies you were looking at, and I was recounting again, it's a lot. It's 14 to 16 extra books of the Old Testament. The New Testament is no different. But when you go to the Old Testament and you look at, now here's the thing, now, now, <laughs> be honest with you. Here, here was what some denominations can do to you. That's why we're non-denominational. They can kind of, to be honest, I was a little brainwashed. Because <laughs> think about the flawed thinking here that I'm going to take you through. This is what I did. I look at the Bible I have in my hand. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm clearly given the facts. Like, this is what Jesus and the apostles were looking at. <laughs> well, they must have gotten to this. This is better. <laughs> think, think, right? Think, though, carefully. What I'm holding in my hand, you know, 1,500 years, they definitely got it right. What? Like, Jesus and the apostles did not have it right. That's interesting. And so, it, but I wrestled. I'm like, okay. So I started looking through history. I'm like, well, somewhere along the line, they must have got to this. You know, must have figured out, you know, Jesus, you were kind of wrong <laughs> about your Bible, right? And I kept looking, and here's the thing. I got to the 300s. Same thing. 14 to 16 extra books. Oof. Starting to hurt. It goes to Latin. They retain the old books. It's not a Catholic thing. Catholic's not until 1054, the schism. <laughs> so it's all before that. Latin, 405. Jerome. <laughs> the extra books are there. So I kept looking at it. This must be a Protestant thing because Martin Luther must have fixed this. So <laughs> I looked at a 1560 Geneva. They're all in there. Yes, there are English Bibles, Matthews as well, before the KJV. So I get to the King James Bible, 1611 King James Bible. They're in there. 
uh-oh. Then I did the history. Martin Luther said, they're good to read. He didn't think they were scripture. They're good to read, he said. What? <laughs> this is interesting. In fact, what I found out was, and you put the KJV if it wasn't up. Yeah, so that's, that is my 1611 King James Bible. There's Tobit right there. Now, <clears throat> it remained in all Bibles until the mid-1800s. Uh-oh. So this is interesting, right? Let's use round numbers. Christianity, 2,000 years old. Round numbers. About what, what is that, mathematicians? For 1,800 of that 2,000 years, all Christians were reading them. I would say the majority, 90% of Christian, Christian history, they're in there. Now, we talk about Bible study, why they're not. There's really no good theological reason at all. And I've studied this thing like backwards and forwards for many years. None. There's no reason for them not to be there. So I will get into it a little bit later. A bit of a dispute got them taken out. But logic, right? Let's think about that. The Bible redacted. So here's another thing that should blow your mind if you're really into theology or you came from where I came from. You're not non-denominational yet or you're working your way there. Open-minded. <clears throat> there are references in the KJV. And what the references do is when somebody's saying something or someone might be quoting something, the translator will give you a reference. They'll go, this is what they're quoting in the Old Testament, perhaps, right? Or this is like that. He's saying it again. So what this really got me is in the New Testament, Luke, there are at least two examples in the New Testament. There are references to Tobit. That's interesting. Sermon on the Plain, the translators, not me, the translators of the 1611 KJV are saying, Jesus has this in mind, or he's quoting this from Tobit. See, it's over there, probably midway on the page. That's unbelievable. The other one, we'll look at it. He's talking about a wedding feast where you have to invite the poor and the blind in particular. This will get interesting. They're saying, referencing Tobit. Kind of interesting. So if you come from that background, it really is, and, and you know, Tony knows this too, it's, it, it's kind of like mind-bending, you know, because you've been told that, 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 and then you realize, hold on a second. You know, you've got to arm yourself with the facts. And so there's a lot of like, I know what I know what I know because someone told me. And so everything I'm saying, fact check it. Fact check it. Open your own Bible. Vet your sources, but look at the facts and you'll see these are just all facts. It's interesting. So we encourage you here, and this is a funny thing, and kind of an irony, that, you know, that was an early Christian tradition in Protestantism. That was the thing, right? Think for yourself. That was kind of the point. Think for yourself. Read your own Bible. Don't just do things because someone tells you. But over the years, I think it just went... Don't think for yourself. Just believe what we say implicitly. Careful. All right. So Christians, regardless of where you are, I'm done. <laughs> you should take an interest. A lot of Christians pride themselves, people pride themselves in being well-read well and educated and able to talk as well. <laughs> Interested in classic works, correct? So how much more should a Christian be interested in reading a book that was in all Bibles? <laughs> for the majority of Christianity, just for the sake of being well-read. And on that point, you're probably going to hear Handel's Messiah. You might not even know it, but you'll probably hear Handel's Messiah this year. You'll be, you'll hear it on a commercial, and he shall reign forever, and, right? So, hallelujah. So, popular song. Well, Handel also put out an album <laughs> called Tobit. So people would have known about this. You might have heard of a guy named Rembrandt. He painted about the story of Tobit. And we're going to get to some of these things too. So it's a part of being cultured and educated. Right? So look at it that way. All right, so Tobit, placement, where it is. Probably not chronological. It gets placed in a bunch of different places. I think there's a second Rembrandt there. <clears throat> there you go, very famous one. Uh, it gets put sometimes, usually around Tobit or Judith, or sorry, Judith and Esther. Tobit is in there in, in the Bible. Probably not a fictional uh, story, or uh, it's a non-fictional story, right? So probably not. Uh, it's a, someone was laughing because you probably know what happens in the story, but weirder things happen in the Bible. So I don't know, right? But it would be around the time of the Assyrian exile. So I'm going to hop right into Tobit. 
I'm not going to do any of the uh, verses on the screen until we get to a certain point. I'll just kind of uh, paraphrase the story. It's 14 chapters. It would take a while if I gave you every single detail. I'll give you the points. All right, so Tobit begins kind of like Nehemiah, and he's uh, writing the first person. He's talking about himself, and he takes you all the way back to the split kingdom. So we'll go back in the series a little bit. So they have like their civil war, if you remember correctly. And so the north, you have Jeroboam. In the north, Rehoboam, that's Solomon's son. And he's being punished for Solomon's many sins. There's a divided kingdom. Ten technically in the north, two in the south. But we'll get into that a little bit later. So Judah, south. Israel, north. In Judah, they have the temple, and that's the appropriate place you got to go if you want to worship three times a year, so they take pilgrimages. But his tribe, Naphtali, is not doing that. Uh, so they are worshiping like the, 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 the calf idol that Jeroboam built. This one's in Dan. There's another one in Bethel. He says they're going to Dan. So his relatives are going and doing the false worship in Israel. Jeroboam's making a political move to keep them in the north and not have them go to the south and lose his army or his population, whatever. So he's doing the right thing. So immediately I think of Nehemiah, right? Like, not me. I was the only one in my tribe who wasn't partaking in that and going to the real festival. So you get this air right out the gate. There's a lot about, maybe you know the word almsgiving. Right? So it's like kind of a giving to the poor. So there's a lot of charity going on. He's a very charitable person. He takes you up to the time of the Assyrian exile. And so this is where he's going to get taken away into captivity. He mentions he has a wife. His wife's name is Anna, and his son's name is Tobias. And this is where it starts to get a little confusing because Tobit, Tobias, and now you're going to have all these different names. And if I get all the names right, it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit today because it's very, very difficult. So <clears throat> they're taken away to Nineveh. Sound familiar? So in a Syrian city. Now he makes mention of this guy, Gabiel who he gives money to. So right, think about it. He's going to be taken away in exile. So it's like 600 pounds of silver. So he has a lot of money, right? And he, he puts it in the care of this guy, gives it to him because he's being taken away. So now he makes mention that he has a habit of burying the dead. Uh, that may sound weird, but he takes us back to Shalmaneser and Sennacherib. And if you remember the story of Hezekiah, he doesn't like the Jewish people. And so what a lot of these people would do, you know, these Assyrian conquerors and any of these armies, they would kill dead bodies. Maybe you've seen it in the movies where you'd have these dead bodies, you know, like crucified along the road or impaled along the road. It's supposed to strike fear in the heart of your opponent. That's the idea. But what Tobitz is doing, he's saying, oh, a Jewish person, I have to give them an honorable burial. So this is a big thing he likes to do. He buries the dead. So it goes on and on about this, but... Sennacherib finds out he's okay with his dad or his predecessor, but Sennacherib comes into power. He doesn't like it. He finds out about it. He finds out it's Tobit, and Tobit has to flee. He loses everything, essentially. And he, he's away from Tobias and now his wife, Anna. So <clears throat> if you remember the account, what happened, and it kind of says this, during Hezekiah's time, what happens is uh, the Lord kills 185,000 of them. And then he flees. He goes away. And then his sons kill him. So we see that happen here. Drimelech and Sherazer, Sh Sh I think his name is. So a new uh, Assyrian emperor becomes king, Esarhaddon. Under Esarhaddon, Tobit lucks out because his uh, nephew, Ahiakar, he becomes like some high official. I think he's in charge of all the money. And so his nephew allows him to come back through him. So now he's back, and they're celebrating. The family's reunited. Everyone's really happy. So what happens is he has a feast. Now, remember this one. And he tells Tobias, his son, go out and find someone who is poor, someone who is needy. We're going to do this charity. We're going to invite them to a feast when we have a feast. I believe it's the Feast of Weeks they're celebrating. And so he's being charitable. But when Tobias goes out, he doesn't find a poor person. He finds a dead body in the marketplace. And so Tobit hears about it, and he's going to do his thing. So he goes out to bury the dead, and everyone's like, are you crazy? This is what got you chased away in the first place. He hides it in a shed. He finishes the feast in sorrow. He goes out and buries the dead again. Are you nuts? Like, this is what <laughs> got you chased out of here in the first place. But it just shows his character. He's going to constantly be very good. So comes back in. He's tired, and he falls asleep in a courtyard. What he doesn't know is that there are birds above him. And the birds poop. 
in his eyes. <laughs> Again, not the weirdest thing we've seen in the rest of the story, right? But still weird. And what happens is it blinds him. And he's blind for four years. Now, Hayekar's nephew takes care of him for a couple of years. But then he's gone. And so now his wife Anna has to work. And it brings us to a really funny scene where Anna is selling garments. <laughs> and so to one client, she sells a garment, and they give her a kid, a goat. That's an old word for kid. <laughs> a goat as a present. She comes in, it's like, <laughs> he hears it and immediately accuses her of stealing it. And so they have a domestic, right? So they're going back and forth. They have a fight about it. And at the end, though, she wins. She rebukes him. So now, and so there's two paintings. That's the Rembrandt there. <clears throat> and so now he has a prayer. It's like this self-loathing prayer. It makes me kind of laugh because it's one of those things he loses an argument. But like, God, I just want to die. You know? <laughs> I'm blind. It's really kind of funny, but it, the store has this air of comedy, you know, irony and comedy in it. And so I just want to die. Kill me, Lord. I'm done being blind. I'm done with this world. So he's praying about this. And this is the basic topic of the prayer. Now, like kind of a good movie, there's a cutaway scene to a new character right after this. And they're going to do similar things. It's Sarah. Sarah has a different issue. Every time she tries to get married, like on the wedding night, this jealous demon, Asmodeus, comes in and kills the husband. That's a problem. It happens seven times to this poor girl. But she's getting no sympathy. A servant of her father's, I believe, is making fun of her. You husband, kill her. You'll have no child. You should just die. And so she's like, yes, I should. She makes a decision to go and hang herself. But she decides, no, I'm my dad's only daughter. It would send him to his grave, right? And then he'd be embarrassed. And then they'd make fun of me still, even in death, right? So she decides not to, but does the same type of prayer. But you know what? God, kill me. I'm done with this so that they can't make fun of me anymore. That's the point. So now, it's two characters. God hears the prayer. So he sends an angel, Raphael, to help them. So, and he's going to solve, goes through everything. He's going to solve the whole thing. All, everybody's problems is going to be solved. So he's sent there to do that. All right, so Tobit thinks he's going to die. He gets Tobias in. He gives him this big, long set of instructions. Sounds like a lot of Jesus' teaching, why you get a lot of those references. Sounds exactly like it. Gives him all, treat others the way you want to be treated. Gives him all these different instructions. And so then he says, you know what? Ah, the 600 pounds of silver. Gabriel right? and uh, Rajas, I think. So <clears throat> go to media and get it. Tobias, I've never been to media. I don't know how to get there. Okay. Go find a traveling companion. He does, sure enough, first person he meets, Raphael. But he disguises himself. He calls himself Azarias. Doesn't want anyone to know he's an angel. There's a back and forth. Yeah, I can get you there. Goes in, meet the dad. A back and forth with the dad. Dad's very skeptical, but finally convinces him, yeah, I'm one of your kinsmen. It's all good. I'm going to take him there. And everything's going to be fine. So this is the mission, to get the money. And so here we see... <laughs> they're, they're off on a mission, they miss artwork, and there's a dog. And the dog is mentioned very specifically, and I believe uh, the writer did this very intentionally. Because a dog is going to represent what? Friendship, companionship, loyalty. So if you haven't yet identified with the characters, if your heart hasn't yet been drawn into the story, it will be now. Right? Dogs. I'm a dog person. So, you know, it did for me. I was like, oh, the dog, cool. You know, and you picture the dog like beep, 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 running along, right? Awesome. So now we are on a quest with a dog. So this is great. I'm in love with this story. So here we go. We're going to see now quest items. So they stop on the quest, right? And they go to the Tigris River to wash their feet. I want to be clean. They're going to wash their feet. And something that seems strange happens. A fish comes up and tries to bite Tobias's foot. But think about it. There's these weird shows that I pass by. I don't watch them all the time, but I see them for me. You know, like there's people, they stick their hand in the mud. And what is it? A catfish comes up. And is that, am I right? You know, I'm like, that's weird. But so it's a thing, right? The fish will try to bite your hand, and that's how you catch it. Not for me. Anyway, it's just weird, right? So, but that happens. It's a real thing. Raphael, the angel, save the fish. We need it. Why? Okay, because its heart, liver, and gallbladder have medicinal purposes. Okay, save them, they salt the fish, eat some fish, take the salted fish with them, continue on their journey. Quest items. So here's the thing, though. What are they for? Glad you asked. So Tobias asks the question, like, what's this for? And he's lucky. He has an angel with him, who knows? So he's like, listen, 
<laughs> the heart and the liver, it can be used to chase away a demon. Interesting. Okay. And then the gallbladder to cure someone's eyes. So no light bulbs yet, Tobias? You know? <laughs> so not really. But then he tells him, Raphael tells him about Sarah, the girl who was praying. And says, ah, we're going to make a pit stop there. Ekbatana. So you remember that from Judith, maybe. So we're going to make a pit stop there, and you're going to get a wife and the inheritance and everything. She, just the way the Old Testament works just sounds strange to us, but back then, she's kin, right? So she has to marry you. Good deal, but Tobias is like, wait, I heard about these seven guys. I don't want to be eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? So no, <laughs> I'm scared, I'm not doing it. And so you're wondering as the reader, right, like, oh, heart, liver, demon. And like so, but he's not getting it, and that's intentional. And so anyway, it'll be fine. You'll do it. So they finally get to this guy, Raguel and Edna, maybe where the name came from. Raguel and Edna. And they're super nice and everything, and they welcome him in to stay. Because remember, it's just a pit stop. And so they're going to stay there. And there's this kind of conversation, like Tobias is... Um, He's talking to Raphael, like, basically, you know, when are you going to get me Sarah? You know, go talk to Raguel about the daughter. Like, he's excited. Young man, he's like, yes. It's really weird in the story, too. It says he fell in love with her before he even meets her. It's like he started to fall in love with her. You know, he's like, you picture a young man, like, oh. You know, so anyway. You know, so he's, yeah, but the dad overhears, and he's kind of like, um, yeah, you're right. She's kinsman, but. Uh, let me tell you a story about seven dead guys, right? So, you know, and they're like, no, 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 I want to marry her anyway. Okay. So they get the marriage contract done, and they're going to do it, right? So here comes the wedding night. But <laughs> really funny feature in the story, before the wedding night, <laughs> they go out and they dig a grave for Tobias. <laughs> it's a really funny feature in the story. They dig a grave for him, like, and, and the, just paraphrasing, the wording's kind of like, yeah, it would be kind of embarrassing if this happens again. So we're going to just dump this body off and, like, get rid of the shame, right? So that's really the motivation for doing it. Okay, so it segues to this, this uh, wedding night. What happens is this is kind of like an all-in-one. There's a bunch of things happening at once. You can see the demon being taken away. So he's obedient, and he puts the heart and liver on the incense. The smoke chases away Asmodeus. He goes to Egypt, it says specifically, but Raphael goes and binds him, binds the demon. So the next morning, they find the young couple. And they're alive. So everything's really good. And so this leads to a two-week feast. But then Raphael is sent to go get that 600 pounds of silver. So go get the money. I want to get that part of the journey done with the quest. Finish that part because i got to get back to my parents. And so this whole thing, there's the parents are worried. The parents are worried. And it's always back and forth. That's what's going on here. So now <clears throat> they're headed back with a dog. Again, so that's kind of interesting. They mention the dog again. They get back to Nineveh. Long story short, immediately Tobias uses uh, the heart and the liver to the gallbladder chased away the demon. I probably got that wrong. Gallbladder chased away the demon, heart and the liver heals the eyes. Now I'm doubting myself. Anyway, could be wrong. So there it is. There's a painting of it. I believe it is the gallbladder heals the eyes. But what's kind of cool here is it will remind you uh, if you read. Uh, your Bible a lot reminds you of Paul in Acts where the, the scales come off his eyes. It's kind of an interesting little foreshadowing perhaps. So that's what happens. Raphael, he reveals his identity. They're really scared. They're like, oh, it's an angel. Don't worry. Everything's fine. The angel ascends to heaven. Chapter 13, you get Tobit's Song of Praise. We'll go back there in a little bit. And then there's an epilogue. Tobias dies at the ripe old age of 117. Tobit is a love story, which acts as an icon, a picture of God's love for us. That's the point. And it may make you think of John 3.16. God loved us so much. Also, he sent his one and only son. So there's a foreshadowing of God in sending his one and only son, Jesus. As Sarah is saved through this son, Tobias, Likewise, we are saved. The Father has sent the Son to save us. Also, Tobias' bride is seen by some, especially in the early church. It's like a picture of Christ and his church. So this is what a lot of commentators in the early church would say. Now, speaking of brides, we're going to get to the New Testament. We're going to bring it to Jesus here. 
Luke 20. If you're familiar, you have the parable of the tenant farmers. Another story Jesus kind of makes up. Right? So you have the tenant farmers there. So <clears throat> they're killing the prophets is the thing. And he sends his one and only son, and they kill him too. Gets to another famous question. Do we pay taxes or not? Give to Caesar. What is Caesar's? The Pharisees ask a question. Then the Sadducees ask a question. Luke 20, 27. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They pose this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife but no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died. The third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them who died without children. Finally, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Now, what they're getting to is the resurrection. So Jesus corrects them on that. You're wrong about what you believe, but they don't believe in the resurrection. This denomination of Judaism. They don't believe in it, so he's correcting. God is a God of the living. Right? So that's the point. But on the story, does it sound a little familiar? This is why a lot of early uh, commentators on it, all throughout Christian history, will make the note the other way from this to Tobit or Tobit to this. So there you go, some of the scriptures that kind of line up there. There's Tobit and Matthew, Mark. It's Three times in your Bible, it happens there in the Gospels. The point of the story, though, is that God will look after anyone who seeks him and observes his laws. We can see Tobit doing this. Tobit gives us a picture of a family seeking God first, and then seeking out these things with God's help, right? So <clears throat> Tobit sought to restore his fortunes. So Tobias was seeking this, then seeking a cure, right, of the quest items, seeking a bride. Raphael is sent by God to help them. And in this way, God seeks us. It's a picture of God seeking us. So it's a two-way street, what we're seeing here. But here's the thing. I'm going to bring up something interesting, and then we'll get there. It has been said that no one, is seeking God. Now, if you know the word well, you'll go, ah, Romans 3. Indeed, Romans 3.10. As scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Well, Paul is quoting, and you can pick it, either Psalm 14 or Psalm 53. They're almost identical, certain parts of the Psalm, the beginning. And I want to show you Romans 3. Did we get that? There we go. That's a screenshot of my smartphone. And I just want to make a point that I made earlier. It says specifically, if you click on the little bubbles <laughs> or you read the footnotes, they tell you Paul is quoting what? The Greek version of the Old Testament, not the Hebrew. So it's right there in front of you the whole time. So that point is being made here. But here's the problem. Unfortunately, this verse is quoted out of context and coldly to those who want to keep Christianity a hard country club to get into. No one's seeking God. What does that mean when we just hang on that and stop there? Well, it means we don't have to do, worry about evangelism too much. We can keep our little inner culture the same, right? No. <laughs> We don't need to make a seeker-friendly church. Let's keep the hymns. You know, don't relate to the younger generation. This is always the way we've done it for 100 years. <laughs> right? It wasn't the way it was in the early church. So the Bible also says we are to seek him. And I just put up a whole bunch. We did Psalms, right? So Paul's quoting Psalms. So there's a whole bunch of Psalms there, right? <laughs> that says we are to be seeking God. And also in the New Testament, Hebrews 11.6 is at the bottom. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. So what's going on here? Quickly, because this is important, but I'll do it quickly because I've done it before. 
In order to understand our Bibles, we must understand literary devices, hyperbole being one of them. Talked a lot about this. We cannot do everything Jesus said to do literally. Otherwise, you will not be able to read your Bible. You will have plucked out your eyes. <laughs> you won't be able to turn pages because you will have cut off your hands. The Bible cannot always be read literally. No. And so that's one thing, hyperbole. Paradox. Two seemingly contradictory statements, but when looked at in context, make sense. I'll show you an example of how the Bible does this immediately. And another verse of the day problem. Proverbs 26.4, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. Five, be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools or they will become wise in their own estimation. Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? You know, like, I got this and I was like, <laughs> let's try that again, right? But people just read one verse a day. So it's maybe not a problem for you. This won't come up. Like, five won't come up for like three years, you know what I mean? I don't, or wait, which one? Be sure to end. They, none of these. No one will have, this is not the verse of the day. So you never saw it. Not your problem. Mine. So what's happening here? Both sides of the coin, right? We talked about this throughout the series, right? Both sides of the coin. There's a time for almost everything, Ecclesiastes, right? So both sides of the coin. You have to be able to see that there's a time for everything. So a time to argue with some fools and a time to not argue with some fools. So whatever, I just say more often than not, just don't bother with the fool. So <laughs> if we go to Luke, <laughs> speaking of a coin, we go to Luke 15. So Right after a parable of the good shepherd, right, seeking out one sheep out of the 99, God seeking us, we get one about a woman and a coin, Luke 15, 8. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. These are God seeking us, right? So here's a really good example of how we really need to keep reading. <laughs> we should not interrupt Jesus. Because as Jesus continues, he's going to get to a very famous conclusion. And you should be looking at this conclusion in light of the other ones and the other ones in light of this. Because they are both sides of the coin. The two parables, seeking, seeking. Now check this out. To illustrate the point further... Let's say you just started there, right? You should be going, what was the other? Oh, forget it, right? So <laughs> Jesus told them the story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want, to sh I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between the sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land where he wasted all his money in wild living. Use your imagination. So we know this story. Right? We call it what? The prodigal son. And I want you to think about something. So what happens? He squanders all the money, right? just to, to let you know if you haven't heard it before, squanders the money and he thinks to himself. He takes a job like farming, but they won't even let him have like the pig food, the carob pods. So he's like, ugh, I'll just go back to my dad. I'd rather be a slave for him. And I'm going to tell him, father, I've sinned against heaven and you. Forgive me. Let me be your slave. So he goes back and we see a picture of the father like embracing him, waiting for him and welcomes him back. Has a feast. And his brother's a hater. But anyway, the point here, check this out. When you start the parable, you need to think. As a start, yes, everyone always has the scene, right? So when you think of the, you think of the scene of the father, like, and the boy, like, running toward him. That's a picture you get in your head. Wait, what about the beginning? The father lets the son go. Think about it. Then the son has to seek the father. Ah, did you see that? Important. This is Jesus' conclusion. Yes, God seeks you. <laughs> but he'll let you go, and you'll need to seek him. It's up to you to get yourself back to him. Remember that. We are to seek God. Think about it this way, more logic. If no one is seeking God, not even one, then everyone is disobeying Jesus. Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. 
I want to point to one more interesting story, and it'll make sense, because some of you are probably like, where's the Advent wreath? Are we starting that soon? <laughs> we'll get to that tradition later, and I'll correct it. But anyway, <laughs> just listen. Okay, well, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we'll get there. So let's just go to Tobit. I want, I want to take you to a part of, and trust me, you, you won't go blind if you read it. it just, we're going to look at it. Tobit 13, it's a part of that prayer, and he predicts a future for his people. A bright light will shine to all the ends of the earth. Many nations will come to you from far away, the inhabitants of the remotest parts of the earth to your holy name, bearing gifts in their hands for the king of heaven. Generation after generation will give joyful praise in you. The name of the chosen city will endure forever. A bright light will shine. Sound familiar? What during this time of year happens kind of like that, where there's a light or a star in the sky? The people from other nations are coming, following to bring gifts for the king of heaven. Matthew 2.1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, magi, from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, Malachi. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. He told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go worship him too. Right. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem and went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary. Then they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So some translators will point Tobit to a Matthew. Quite interesting. Now, quick digression before we close during the holiday season. So here's the thing. And if you've been here for a long time, I'm going to make this is going to be short. You're going to hear and go, oh, no. Here we go again. We don't sing We Three Kings. And it isn't because when you sing it, you sound like Sam Eagle from the Muppets. That's not why. It's because it's not biblical. <laughs> They're not kings. That's the first problem. There's only two kings, the evil King Herod and King Jesus in the story. They're magi, astronomers, like, like magicians. They're not kings. Also, it doesn't say three kings. There are three gifts. There could have been like a thousand magi going. So it's just wrong and wrong. Here's another problem, and then I'll finish. I'm, I'm done, I promise. All right, the manger scene. We're going to get to it. Minds are going to be blown. It's going to happen. Because I'm going to show you <laughs> how the shepherds come first, and then like two years later, the magi come. Oops. So <laughs> your manger scene's wrong. Like someone's like, he's killing Christmas. <laughs> like, do it. <laughs> I get emails. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I'm, not, I'm not like the Grinch. So here's the thing. You can have, your pastor said, you can have the manger scene. You can keep the manger scene. Just make the Magi do Elf on the Shelf for a little while. That's just get them out of there, right? Or keep them in there if you like living a lot. So... <laughs> Anyway, that's the truth. So I'm not anti-Christmas traditions. We have a lot of <laughs> we have a lot of fun. That's three emails. <laughs> we have uh, we have a lot of fun. And just quick, 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 quick mention. We love family here at C3 Church. And so I realized we have a Christmas tree in the back. And so look, and here's what I do. It doesn't belong here. It doesn't belong here. It doesn't, nothing, nothing but Jesus belongs here. That's it. It doesn't. So you see what I'm saying? But it can belong in your home, and we have a beautiful cafe. If you've never been here before, we're going to eat. My wife made Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving. I paid greatly for it. I'm surprised I can talk to you right now. So anyway, she makes delicious food. We have tons of food upstairs. Come on up there. There's games for the kids, and then we're going to have the kids help us set up the tree. So I am not 
the Grinch, okay? So then we're going to have the kids do the tree. So bring your kids up there. Let's play. There's games. So I'm into all that stuff, right? I have a lot of fun. I told you, I play Quest video games. Like, I like that stuff. But right here, this service is for Jesus. That's it. It's not for the Magi. It's not for the traditions. It's not for the Christmas trees or the Advent wreaths. All those things came later, and they distract us. Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Okay? I, somebody can just say, Amen. <laughs> that was where I needed you. All right. <laughs> All right. So what's the point? Let's boil it down here, and then we'll go eat. <laughs> we'll have a feast. During this season, we must keep in mind that when we show grace, compassion, and mercy, especially to those who don't seem to deserve it, we are not just bringing gifts to those people. We are bringing gifts to the Lord. That is how we worship, right? So we're like the Magi in that sense. So in our pursuit of the kingdom this season, we must remember that if we have followed and found the light, that we are now to be the light for others. That's how this works. Others seeking it. So as we ourselves continue to seek the kingdom of heaven, we need to be a guiding light for the lost. And we shine most brightly through our actions. Tony talked about tipping. It's just a good starting point, right? But it's a good thing to think about because it's a situation where you may be tempted to think someone doesn't deserve my tip. You brought this up. Someone, they don't deserve it. In that moment, I want to encourage all of you. You didn't deserve God's grace and mercy either. And this always needs to be right here, especially during this season. So I see a lot of Christians that are out there saying, we need to keep Christ in Christmas. Really? Well, then do what he said. Right? It's not a bumper sticker on a car. It's not a, it's not a Christmas tree. Jesus would not have known about Christmas trees. It's not about that. It's about extending that grace and mercy to others, bringing them a gift, like the almsgiving. So we need to think about that. And see, here's the thing, and I think he brought this up, or I'll attribute it to him <laughs> anyway. When we do that, something might happen. The person might go, why did they do that? I think that was a point, right? Why did they do that? I did a bad job. I treated them poorly, yet they tipped me 30%. What? What? Here's the thing, what if that question becomes the beginning of that person's quest for Christ? Think about it. People, Tony sees it out in the community, they're seeking godly things. They are, they're seeking. And when you treat them like that, they see Christ through you. Right? So it's a seed. It's a quest item. We want people to find Jesus through us. We have a purpose. That's it. So just remember this. Your action this season, this week, could be the very thing that sparks someone's quest for Christ. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this church. I thank you for all the people in the church allowing us to be a guiding light to the community around us and a blessing to those around us. And it's just my encouragement. I pray that you fill us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be vehicles, instruments of your mercy, your grace, and your love this season, knowing that this is truly how we keep Christ in it. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>